Hello, ladies and gentlemen of Queensland Pioneer Steam Railway. It's Robert Shearer here with Ben Hussey. Hello. And we're here to talk to you today about risk management. Don't turn off your PC now. Risks are around us everywhere. Hopping into my car is a risk, especially if you're a passenger. The main thing to take note of is what is the difference between a hazard and a risk. A hazard is any item or activity that has the potential to cause harm or damage or an adverse consequence. The risk is the likelihood and outcome of that happening. An inherent risk is the risk prior to any control being put in place. Imagine a complete numpty was put in charge of a railway with absolutely no idea what they were doing. The residual risk is the risks following the application of control measures. So that means policy, standards, sometimes good old fashioned common sense. This is kind of geared up towards uh, the managers taking more of a role in uh, identifying risks rather than it all being carried out by the top level of people who might not actually be carrying out the work themselves. Yes, and another thing to note is that sometimes uh, we have no idea how things are done safely on a lower level. You guys may actually know the safest way forward. Assessing the risk associated with each day that we kind of undertake on the railway is kind of the first step in, in the risk assessment process. And really, it's involved thinking through the process involved and categorising um, that risk. So there's a handy table at the end of our standards that help you. Basically, for each of the activities uh, and the, the hazard that, that's involved with the activities, you have to rank the severity and the likelihood of that hazard occurring while undertaking that work. For example, if a train derails, there is the chance that someone could have a life-threatening uh, injury out of it. Uh, there's also a chance that no one would even know it would come off the rails. In those situations, it's finding the average between those two things. A good example here is, you know, the uh, likelihood an exposure of greater of 500 people, you know, that's a six. But there could be absolutely no evidence that this has ever happened anywhere in the world, which is a one. So those are two contradicting um, scores, but they meet out in the middle and make a three and a half. So once you've assessed the uh, risk associated with the hazard, you then have to think about how we implement control measures to reduce that risk. Uh, and often these are already in place. Um, and to be honest, almost everything we do is in some way uh, a method of reducing that risk. We PSA is making sure that people don't fall out windows. There is a series of controls that run from least effective to most effective. It's sort of an inverted pyramid scheme, really, isn't it? So starting at the most effective, you have elimination. That is to remove an item. So in our case, that would be removing passengers from trains. Mm. Thereby, you've eliminated the risk. That is not practical. Mm -hmm. So while effective, it would not work. So let's move down the hierarchy. You then have substitution. Can we substitute in a alternative operation? So that would maybe be in the event of a fire season. Can we bring in a diesel locomotive and would that reduce the risk of fire as compared to a steam engine? Engineering controls. This is where you have a way of isolating people from the hazards. So in our case, if we were scared of collisions, for example, one item may be adding seat belts to carriages. Administrative controls are where we have something in writing. This tends to be one of the more used ones. And finally, the lowest form of control is PPE. Once you've uh, listed out all your control measures, 
you then reassess your risk with those control measures in place. And that becomes the residual risk. The idea of the risk assessment is basically to work out how much risk we've remains once we've implemented all our control measures, and if there's still too much risk once we've implemented our control measures. Once you've categorized your likelihood and consequence, you come back to uh, a combined risk score. What you do is you add together the likelihood and consequence scores and you get a, an output and that output is graded into to certain bands. Anything up to an eight, uh, which is where we get into the orange, you can basically do pretty much run of the mill fairly easily. Once you get up to an eight, you need to start asking your manager. This is where their judgment comes into effect. But once it goes beyond a 10 and into an 11, that's where we're reaching the extreme points of um, risk. And that's where the board needs to be asked. Ben and I are going to undertake a risk assessment of despiking and removing a sleeper. Fairly run of the mill thing, but it gives you an idea of what goes into a risk assessment and how to use the risk assessment tool provided to you, SMS 10. So, first off, we work out who's involved in this risk assessment. So, we've got Ben Hussey. Hi, Ben. Hello. And Robert Shearer. The date today is the 21st of the 7th. And we're talking about sleeper removal, including despiking. So we've got pinch points, flying objects. Have you ever seen one of those lock spikes let go quickly? Uh, what else have we got? So associated with these hazards, we've got injury to work, injury, injury to workers. We've got inappropriate use of equipment. That's a hazard. Uh, what do you mean by inappropriate though? Well, a person. Incorrect. In yeah, incorrect, incorrect use of equipment. So, okay, also so, incorrect use of equipment. So things like, you know, a person not holding the Yankee by the right way, if they push down, they'll yeah. crush themselves. Um, so inherent risks, uh, injury to worker, to worker, um, you've also got um, asset damage, not for any of those. Damaged tools, damage hmm. to, to equipment, or put damage to equipment. Okay, so we're now down to what would happen in numpty land. So, going through this, 1A. So, 1 is re uh, relating to the hazard, and A is relating to the inherent risks. So, what's the minimum consequence of uh, a pinch point causing worker injury? So for this, we'll go back to the likelihood and consequence rankings. So typical injury from a pinch point is going to be kind of minor damage, maybe to your hands. So mm -hmm. it might be first aid. Uh, so I'd probably say it's probably around a two or a three potentially. Yeah. Um, um, you know, might be ongoing. Paramedic ongoing attention. Issues. So uh, maybe. Yeah. Two, maybe, maybe well, you could probably go out to a four if an absolute numpty was in charge. Yeah, let's go for a three. I mean, him across the road. So if we go for a minimum of two up to four, the average score is going to be three. And the likelihood of that happening, again, probably going to happen every, you know, we do track work every month. Yep. So, you know, that, that could happen potentially every couple of months. Yes, but you know, has there been month. a history of it, though? I mean, have we had people injuring themselves constantly on Not both seriously, sides? seriously. I, I can't remember any injury 
where first aid was actually required on a track working day in the last three years. So sure. we can actually say that between and maybe between every six months and every ten years. Yeah, yeah, I'd go so that five to three. And because it's only going to affect you know one to two people at a time. Yeah, you, you can actually make the minimum of one. That's true. There you go. So the overall risk three. Yeah. Now we go to 1B. Can pinch points cause damage to equipment? No. That, well, like Not pinch points directly. No, not pinch points directly. No, that's true. So what we'll do is we'll blank that off with an X. So now we're at 2. So flying objects causing injury to worker. Now, um, likelihood. It's happened a bit, mm. and in, in the Heritage Rail area, um, I'd, I'd go maybe six to six to four. Although you've got a one, you know, you're not going to hit, hit more than fifteen people with the one object. That's true. All right. So that comes out 3. of 5? yeah, three point five. And again, and, the consequence is going to be very similar to pinch points. And so well, let, let's consider it because, yeah. you know, we've got, uh, what do we got? Um, well, we're not going to get life, oh, well, you could get a life threatening injury if it hits you in the head. Mm. True. No, I'd say major injury. Yeah. A major injury. Potential hospitalization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Through to two. Minor injury. Yeah. yeah. I'd probably be inclined to go a six purely because, you know, one of those things hits you in the cranium. However, remember we're in numpty land at the moment. That's true. So these are people who have no idea what they're doing. So that's an average of four. Yep. That sounds about right. Uh, and then damage to equipment. Again, unless you count a bolt as a bit of equipment. <laughs> well... Flying object did hit um, a tool that probably wouldn't break it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Nah, All you're right. probably right in that. So incorrect use of equipment. So say if we're actually de-screwing. Yeah. You know, something like that. So incorrect use of equipment. So injury you know, to worker. First. Yep. yep. Yeah, it's very likely to happen. Um, Miss swinging of hammer. You know, the, yeah, someone could get hit time. in the head. Consequence. Um... Well, that's probably going to be, you know, someone could die mm. quite easily if you miss swing a hammer and, you know, you go back into someone's head. I'm going to go five. Okay. Five to two. Mm. But again, there hasn't been, in the Rail Heritage Circle, I can't think of... Yeah. Anecdotally, any injuries, and I can't remember seeing it come across my desk that there's been all that. It's been a lot of people on the heritage railways doing that. Big railways, yes, but I mean, look at the scope and nature of their work. So, um, again, the likelihood of it happening is it's only going to affect one person, maybe two. Mm -hmm. So, would you say that's a one of five, maybe four? Under four again. Okay. Not five. Three. And three B. So incorrect use of equipment. Damage the equipment. <laughs> it's very likely. Go on, that. Ben. You know what you every want to say here. <laughs> every week. Every week. Especially every week. if Robert's on the end of the yeah. tool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what is your fucking own up and minute? I was right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have a new commentator, Mr. Peter Dance. The consequence uh, is probably very low. Um, again, damage, damage equipment. I don't know. Um, damage to tool. Most of the work, most of the work we're going to be here is small tools. Yeah, you know, small tool, it's, hand it's, tools, hand yeah. tools. Um, so you see, moderate to minor ashes, acid. A damage, yeah. So, yeah. So three, so three and two mm -hmm. comes out of about a two point five. So there we go, there's our inherent risks done and dusted. So we now know that in Numpty Land, the total risk of 
removing a sleeper is the average of those numbers. So now let's look at the controls. We've got the hierarchy control up there so that we know what we're looking at. So what controls do we have in place? So toolbox talks. Yep. So we're educating. Yeah. Um, we've got the standards set down in um, track work. the track, track work, work manual. So that's an administrative control, so AD. Toolbox chalk, that's administrative again. Obviously we wear safety protection. Okay, um, there are any engineering controls. Actually, the tools we're using were engineered by the railways, so they're fit for purpose. They're not the most modern tools, but for what we're doing, they're the correct tool for the job. True. Oh, and stout boots. That, that comes under PPE. What else could we have? Let, let's let's consider what we don't currently do. Sleeper replace sleeper replacement machine. Couldn't de spike stuff though. No. Mechanized de spiking apparatus. It's possible. Such things exist. However, we would have to reject that one, wouldn't we? Because it would be outside the economic confines of the railway, wouldn't it? So, remember, consider all options, no matter how stupid, but then work out why you can't do them. So, once you work out who's responsible for it, so in this case, it's the supervisor, um, and I suppose it'd also be the manager, really, on the toolbox talks, because you're making sure that that all comes back to you. Um, the risks addressed. Now, that's actually talking about which of the risks have been addressed. So, injury to worker, damage to equipment. So, the toolbox talk addresses both A and B. Doesn't look bad. The track work manual, again, A and B. Safety glasses would only really help with A. And A, B. Okay. Now we're up to the resultant risks. So this is with the controls in place above. Have we actually dropped things down? Have they stayed stagnant? So if we go through them, we've implemented, if we go back to 1A, so Pinch points mm. injury to worker, the likelihood of those happening is likely to go down. Mm. Consequences yep. are going to change. The likelihood will, will change. Drain. So let's go back to our, our consequence ranking. We can probably drop that down from, from a 5 to 4, I reckon it's probably reasonable. Yeah, I'd say so. And then on 2A, so that's, that's uh, flying, flying objects, objects, injury to worker. So, we're dropping the likelihood down by having the PPE in place. Yep. And uh, we're, and we're dropping the consequence, actually. So, we can probably, probably see... get it down. I mean, I, I'm probably looking at... Four. You're only needing a four, yeah. Yeah, four. And probably a one. Um, and then, <laughs> on the likelihood, again, probably down to, down to five. I'd even go four. Sure. You know, has there been evidence of this happening in the tourist and heritage sector or here? Yeah, not so much. Not really, no. Not so much. Seems to be more mainline because of the sheer number of yeah. sleepers they do. Um, incorrect use of equipment. So injury to worker. Um, so we've now again doing being toolbox tops when people don't know what they're doing. Uh, we've got our PPE in place. And we've got the manual, so that explains how to correctly use the tools. So, so if we go back to the consequence. So, consequence. Oh, look. I don't think you change the consequence. 
vastly. You know, if it goes wrong, it goes wrong. Yeah, it does, that's true. Um, it just reduces the likelihood of it going wrong. Yeah. Although the PPE does, because this is injury, isn't it? Yeah, yeah but, I mean, a tool, a tool's uh, incorrect use of a tool, your PPE's not going to... Necessarily save really, it, no. It's going to be a, it's going to be a breakage. Yeah. Okay, so that could stay as is. But uh, your likelihood... Point you down again, I think. For let, injury let, to work, we're, I yeah. think, consistent. We're going, we're going to have to be going down to four. I'd say three, even. Three, three, yeah, three. And then taking the consequence. Um, again, oh, sorry, this is not consequence. This is uh, likelihood for... So go up, what are we looking at? Uh, damage to equipment. Through uh, incorrect use. Yeah, incorrect use. Again, that's already three. I don't think we need to touch that, to be honest. Look, I think the cons uh, the consequence changes because we're not going to get total asset damage. Mm. Yeah, it's true. Um, we don't find. So, I think we you, you've jumped that round the wrong way. Okay. Probably a three, even because I mean, with with what we've got in place, it should drop. Yeah. Would well, you agree with that assessment? Yeah, yeah. that sounds fine. All right, let's uh, top top the numbers. <laughs> no, things have only really dropped by about one and a bit. One and a bit, which is really a one, but it's still dropped, mm -hmm. and we've managed the risk. So far as is reasonably practical. Now, do we feel that this needs to be reviewed at any point? Yes, when the track mark manual changes. Agreed. And that is now the last thing you, as a volunteer, need to do. From here, the board will validate this risk assessment of the meeting. Um, 